or secondary treatment. And me, I still use secondary treatment. I don't know yeah, if I should uh, even abandon that. I don't know. But my point is, yeah. in archaeotonatology, secondary is not used. In archaeotonatology, yes, and that's why... Yeah, no, no, it was just no, no, that is, I think but, it's useful. Oh, no, I emphasize, but archaeologists, they still yeah. use it so much, yeah. that's the problem. Yeah. So in yeah. archaeotonatology, yes, yeah. so that's yeah. the point. Yeah. But you see secondary barrier in Greece, in Mycenaean Greek archaeology, yeah. all these assemblages are published basically as secondary barriers. Yeah. Yeah. So this no, is that it's, was my... It's a work of education. Mm. Yeah. But uh, a, more, uh, a more important question to you. Uh, uh, excavation is also a, a taphonomic process. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So how much do you know about the excavation? Because some of the removal versus retention numbers just surprised me. And I was thinking that a lot of the non-recorded hand bones, for example, or foot bones, might be that they are just not uh, collected and documented. And exactly. that might show us new records. So what are your thoughts? I'll tell, I'll tell you exactly how I approach that. Uh, that's the main difficulty, how much excavation bias we have when we try to apply these bone frequencies. And unfortunately, this, this was not the site that I was present during the excavation. But it was excavated in the 90s fairly well, not fantastic, but fairly well. So we had a very detailed record and I was able to use photos, as we hear as well, photos, notebooks, excavation notebooks, plus the final reports, drawings, all of that. In terms, and, and I had an idea of the level of record, the quality of recovery that they had. However, recovery was pretty okay and they were very careful because maybe not because they were so interested in the bones, but because they were interested in machine and beads and stuff like that. Yeah. They really mm -hmm. sieved everything and so they were careful and I had, I could see that I had small stuff, so when I did they have. But most importantly, and this is in the end what I used also as the main criteria is, but that makes it more difficult for comparison with other sites. That mm -hmm. For this intra-site comparison, the same methods were applied in all the tombs. So these differences that I observed, at least they were consistent, so what, however they were excavating, they were excavating the same all of these tombs. So when in some cases I have, in other cases I don't have them, they didn't change the methodology of their excavation. So that was reassuring up to a point. Thank you. I think that the first question regarding um, what expressions are being used and how we are recording and that could be something that we discussed about during the discussion slot because it's an interesting something that everyone can think about and I know that people have a lot of different opinions on yeah like you brought up as well that maybe we need several um completely new yeah areas. exactly yeah. so that's an interesting thing to keep with us I think we're going to move on to next presentation and after that one we have a discussion so please welcome uh, Rita Kedoteuhana and Lee Nilsson Stutz who are presenting the lost photos archaeopanatology applied to photo documentation from the 1960s and reveals new data about Mesolithic bur burials. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are going to present uh, new data on Mesolithic burials based on the archaeotonatological analysis of recently discovered photographs from excavations in the 1960 and 1962. Let's see. Uh, the archaeological material we are working with uh, is from late Mesolithic sites in Portugal. These are uh, open-air shell middens and are clustered in these two river valleys, the Tagus and the Sado valleys. What's remarkable uh, is that most of these sites have burial grounds with several human burials. This is interesting and we're highlighting this because the development of cemeteries in open-air sites contrasts with earlier practices in the region. As you can see from this graph, um, with the number of minimum number of individuals, uh, Mesolithic individuals in archaeological sites in Iberia. Funerary burial was practiced in Iberia, in the Mesolithic, but it was not common. It was not a way, a common treatment of the dead, except in these two river valleys. Most of this material um, was excavated in the 1950s and the 1960s. And we are focusing on one region, the Sado Valley. Um, 
From the 11 shell middens known, six of them have human burials, with a minimum number of individuals of 113. Um, as I mentioned, these are old excavations, and the original documentation consists of written notes and letters, as well as site plans. Not for all sites, but for some sites. Uh, we also have photographs and drawings in variable detail, not for all sites. And also, we have the human remains. Some of this material was preserved uh, in blocks of paraffin, which is great for burial analysis. However, most material is um, currently disarticulated and stored in containers. The photos on this slide were recently discovered and bring new information for the material excavated in two sites, Arapoco and Poças de São Bento. This documentation is also very interesting because burial practices in these two sites were largely contemporary with radiocarbon dates on human bone ranging from 8,150 to 7,900 years ago. For this session, we want to present some selected cases uh, that we have analyzed, but also focus on two central questions. One is what is the potential for archaeotanatology on old collections? And second question, what does archaeotanatology bring that cannot be achieved with common sense archaeology? Archaeotanatology is a holistic approach for the analysis of human bones in archaeological context. And it was developed as an excavation method. But we argue that this is a robust approach for the analysis of archive documentation, such as photographs from old excavations. Very briefly, archaeotanatology is based on taphonomic theory and basic knowledge of processes of human decomposition, as these processes can produce marked movements on the bones within the burial feature. This type of analysis allows us to reconstruct the chain operatoire from the human remains recovered in the archaeological context to the original funerary practice. In our analysis of the newly discovered photographs, we identified a number of common features, uh, which indicate a set of common practices. What do these burials have in common? First, their primary nature. These are primary deposits, as indicated by the maintenance of labile articulations, as, such as those on the feet here in, the, in these photographs. Uh, these are diagnostic criteria that are often highly degraded and often not very clearly visible in the documentation. However, the maintenance of the general uh, anatomy uh, or the anatomical integrity of the body is a strong argument supporting this observation of the primary nature of the burials. And it's consistently observed throughout the documentation. The space of decomposition was filled with sediment, uh, as indicated by the maintenance of bones in original unbalanced position, such as the limited collapse of the bones of the pelvic girdle, or the maintenance of the patella on the distal end of the femur. And here just bringing some examples and some examples of key observations. Uh, regarding uh, and summarizing a bit the initial position of the body and what's common in these uh, burials, we observed that at Arapoku, one of the sites, most individuals were placed on the back, while at São Bento, the cadavers were typically placed uh, on the right or on the left side. Uh, in both sites, the upper limbs were often nested on the upper body in various positions, but always in flexion at the level of the elbow joints. The lower limbs 
uh, were consistently flexed as well or hyperflexed at the level of the hip and uh, uh, knee joints rotated towards the trunk, uh, rotated towards the right or the left, with the feet always rotated towards the buttocks. The alignment of the bones, also another common feature, suggests that the grave pits were just large enough to contain the body, uh, as visible by various wall effects. In some cases, uh, we observe that the floor of the grave was uneven and sloping. Um, and here, while the cadaver slowly slid to the left, the right, which can be visible by, by the right shoulder girdle, which stayed behind, and the right scapula became exposed uh, between the humerus and the thoracic cage here, accentuating the lateral pressure uh, on the left side of this feature as indicated by the strong alignment of the humerus and the rib cage. Thank you. Um, and so uh, when we establish kind of a pattern uh, of a normative expected burial that allows us to kind of think through the non-negotiables of mochu ritual. But among the uh, burials in this collection, we also find one particular case where uh, the body position is unusual, both for the cultural context here, and I think in our technological uh, descriptions in general. So it uh, valids some, uh, some uh, publication and analysis. Uh, I won't go into all of the details here, but just briefly uh, note that the photo shows a body that was placed on the back, with the limbs strongly flexed in front of the body, bringing them to lie on top, stratigraphically speaking, of the torso. The head was flexed uh, and rotated, uh, flexed forward and rotated to the right at the time of the deposition. The thoracic cage shows no sign of rotation or even transfer of weight to one side, which indicates that the body was placed on the back. Uh, all limbs are strongly flexed in front of the body and the bones of the left hand can be observed in, 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 uh, in the area of the torso. Um, the resolution of the photo, and here we get to the challenges of working with other people's excavations, but we can talk more about that later, um, doesn't uh, allow for detailed uh, observations here. Uh, the bones of the feet can be observed as being loosely articulated. There's no doubt that uh, this burial this is primary deposition, uh, the articulation of the skeleton as a whole, uh, but in particular of the feet and the left hand, is a clear indicator for primary deposition. The lack of movement outside of the initial volume of the cadaver further indicates decomposition in the fill space. And finally, the maintenance in position of the bones in extreme flexion must have required additional elements of support. Immediate filling in combination with a restricted feature is not enough, in our opinion, to explain the maintenance of the position, uh, uh, of, in particular, of the lower limbs here. We suggest that this body was wrapped or bound at the time of burial. A case like this, can, in our addition, shed light uh, or additional light on other burials in the context, including, um, sorry, uh, in the context, um, uh, in the cultural context, but also more generally, also at the site, obviously, but also more generally for these Mesolithic uh, burials in, in, in Portugal. Were more bodies than we have thought perhaps bound up? How were they bound up? And would the particular position of the body have been discernible? through uh, the wrapping, or would the covering have masked the human body, dramatically changing the appearance of a living versus a dead body at the time of burial, thus playing a crucial part in how death was staged and, and perceived by the survivors. Here we can see an example of the projection upward and rotation of the shoulder, and here we can see the articulation of the, the hand and feet, hands and feet. So what does archaeotanatology bring to the study of archives such as this? Um, that would not be offered by just common sense uh, archaeology. The limitations of a collection like this are obvious, uh, it's clear. Um, but there's still, and this is our point, benefits to working with material like this. Uh, and among those, we want to highlight four points. First, the importance of a systematic description, such as archaeotanatology uh, allows for. Uh, this systematic description of the position of the feature, along with the following systematic approach, for analysis and interpretation clarifies the important boundaries between observation and interpretation. 
uh, casting uh, casting these uh, uh, burials in a clearer light and creating a data set that is, in our opinion, more objective, even when applied to old and fragmentary collections uh, for other scholars to work with in this period. So the systematic approach may in fact be particularly important when the data is imperfect. So instead of saying we shouldn't do archaeogenetology on, on old excavation documents, we probably really should do it there because it's, it's really where it's going to make a huge difference. We also argue that diagnostic observations can be made even in cases like this, and we've showed a couple of examples uh, uh, of that. Uh, we have been able to make critical observations even on partially preserved or partially documented materials, and that has added crucial uh, and detailed information about the mortuary practices, and we've showed a few examples of that. We agree that the systemic uh, thinking that characterizes archaeotanatology brings it all together and looking at the, the relationships between the decomposing human body and the feature allows us to, to really think this through systematically in a way that common sense archaeology does not have a developed tool to do. And finally, most important point perhaps, the systemic detailed approach allows us to get a better understanding of the handling of the body as ritualized practice. <coughs> the repetitive patterns that Rita pointed out that sometimes can be traced even in fragmentary remains through the observation of diagnostic indicators bring to the forth a norm of how dead bodies were handled and deposited within a cultural context. Unusual cases, like the one I uh, uh, presented, might challenge these patterns, but also, as in this case, enrich our understanding by providing a pathway toward the lived experience of the burial of the body. Of course, there will be more insecurity and uh, more remaining question marks when approaching a collection like this with a methodology like archaeotanatology since it relies on careful documentation of ample information. But we hope that we have been able to demonstrate that archaeotanatology is not limited to the field and that it's worthwhile to apply the approach also to excavations and all collections of imperfect documentation that were not produced with this methodology in mind. The principles are robust enough to generate important results and insight even years after the excavation. We also hope that we have been able to show that the application of this approach leads not merely to new and more secure data, but also to richer theoretical understanding of the mortuary ritual in the past. Thank you very much.